Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Han. I'm a software engineer from Facebook. Today, I'm going to talk about how we use JTIT C++ code to handle requests at Facebook scale. So all the requests coming to Facebook go through our layer 7 load balancer, gets massaged, and gets routed to the backend servers. The layer 7 load balancer here plays a really important role of processing those requests. It consists of, of two parts a core HTTP stack. Part of it is already uh, open sourced, known as Proxygen, that handles things like HTTP connection, secure connection, and some routing logic. The other part is a business logic, which process things like parsing uh, URL query parameters or modify the HTTP response header. So as you can see here, the core HTTP stack um, has relatively complex code base, and the final binary can be quite large. However, it's pretty stable because you don't have new HTTP feature every single day. On the other hand, the business logic tends to be lightweight and is much smaller in terms of the file size. But this part has to be iterated really fast because we want to adapt to ever-changing product requirements. Because of this model, we tend to ship a relatively stable but large binary for the core HTTP stack, which was implemented in C++, to all the production servers, whereas we want to iterate fast on the business logic, which is lightweight. A natural solution is to use scripting language for the business part logic. So we were using this, and it was working for years until it wasn't really. In terms of interfacing, we have a lot of great uh, utility function or helper classes defined in the core HTTP stack already in the open source library. Uh, depending on the scripting language you pick, yes, you can provide interface to those helper functions, um, but you need a lot of glue code to do that. So it's sort of working. Once the code is in production, we can have pretty good co testing coverage, so that part is fine. What about debugging? That's not so great for the scripting language if you compare that to the C++, especially a lot of our tooling were built around C++. Uh, profiling is also quite hard. So you don't have ability to dig into a problem to see which part runs slower and try to optimize that is almost impossible. And speaking of performance, because scripting language wasn't designed to be a performant, um, especially in our case, we need to run between the language boundary of uh, C++ and the scripting back and forth. It slows down the request quite a lot. Uh, in addition, you can run into unexpected side effects. Things like random garbage collection pause in the scripting language that can slow the execution of user requests down. And also, you have other problems like unbounded regex matching, um, things like that. So that's definitely not great. What we want is, of course, to be excellent in every single axis, but how? Since I'm here giving the presentation, I think you probably already have guessed, Klein and LLVM to the rescue. We were basically thinking, hey, um, what if we turn C++ into a scripting language? Wouldn't that be great? Especially many of our developers are fairly familiar with C++ language already, so it should be very easy for them to write a script in C++. But how does that work? So again, as I mentioned, we have like a, a big binary, which is a main binary, um, you know, containing all the C++ core stack code. Uh, we want to write the business logic in C++ directly as script. So imagine you want to extract an ID from a URL. In the main binary, you probably want to say, oh, I want to do that thing. But the thing is actually defined in the C++ script telling you how to actually extract the ID. So we are able to update this part uh, pretty frequently without modifying the main binary. And that works by uh, developing a just-in-time compiler engine inside the main binary. So what it does is like it takes the C++ script at runtime, try to convert it into final executable code, so we have everything mapped together in the final main process. That's in a nutshell, right? And also, when you look at the code, you already ask, you're asking, hey, I saw a URL parser in your script. Where does that come from? Well, at the same time, when we build the main binary, we also build all the dependencies in a clam pre-compiled header 
that contains things like a class definition and declaration of URL parser, where a client or the, the JIT engine itself is able to stitch all the pieces together and produce the final executable. I'm going to talk about details later, but these three pieces are the foundation of uh, what we have today for the scripting engine. And these two together, the pre-compiled header and the main binary are bundled together because these two were produced at build time where the C++ script is consumed at runtime. So essentially we ship the last two portion uh, to all the servers and which is a stable version where the script can be iterated fast on. We also have limited support for hot reloaded script, meaning that if you have some script containing business logic, you can ship that to a production server and without restarting the main binary, it can pick up the latest script and execute the latest functionality there. So if we zoom in and take a closer look at, at uh, how it works, basically in the main binary, the JIT engine has CLAN and LLVM libraries statically linked in. So the main binary itself is fully powerful for doing everything. At runtime, it takes the C++ script as well as the pre-compiled header, use clan to convert them to LLVM intermediate representation. So remember that the pre-compiled header and the main binary were both built at the build time and the script is built at the runtime. To make sure it's compatible, we actually extract all the compiler options from the clan PCH metadata. It was pretty much a reverse engineering of clan uh, API, I think it's called uh, PCH validator. We practically look, look at that to see how metadata was laid out and we were able to infer language options, target options, preprocessor options from the PCH and where we were trying to use the same set of compiler options to also compile the C++ script at runtime. Once we have the LLVM IR, uh, the next step is to use LLVM orcjet API to convert that, you know, optimize and linking to produce a final executable code and map that into the memory space of the main process so that the main binary now has access to all the functions um, defined in the, the script. So at linking time, all the symbols that we want to use uh, are extracted from the main binary. I'm going to talk about that in later slides. With everything together, we now are able to like compile the C++ script at runtime or actually at startup time um, and being able to execute that there. But does this solve all the problems we wanted to solve before? In terms of interfacing, now because both the main binary and the script are implemented in the same language, C++, so a lot of great functionalities and utility classes are naturally being exposed to developer to use in the, the scripting land we only need to add minimum glue code there. But are we giving developers too much power? We actually have control in two different ways. We have control in compile time and in link time. Remember at compile time, in order to compile the C++ scripts, all the dependencies come from the pre-compiled header. So already you have a way to restrict what functions, what utilities you want to expose in the script land. At link time, Remember I mentioned all the symbols are extracted from the main binary via linker flag. You have linker flag like dynamic list, which allows you to specify a white list of symbols that you want exposed to the script. So you have very strict uh, you know, restrictions there. In reality though, we found that using pre-compiled header itself can already eliminate a lot of bad code from being written like the fork bomb. Of course, that's based on the assumption that all the scripts are developed by our internal developers who have good intent. Also, because of that, we moved away from using the dynamic list inker flag because in reality, it's quite challenging to make sure the whitelist always keeps up to date. So nowadays, we simply export all the symbols from the main binary to the dynamic symbol table. With everything in place, you can write code. Uh, how about testing? We provide testing in unit test and integration test. For unit test, we create a unit tester utilizing the same JIT compiler engine we have um, and that, that was used to compile the C++ script. And if the JIT engine can comp compile one script, more is, is always better. We allow developer to also write test in a script fashion. And very similar to how we compile the original C++ script, the test script also requires a test PCH to be compiled. And then at runtime, the unit tester basically takes the original script and the test script 
compile them both so they are all available in the same process. Now the test is able to access all the symbols and functions in the C++ script. The test framework also integrated with Google Test. So for anybody who is familiar with writing unit tests in C++, this is how you would write a unit test for testing the script. It's very simple. To test the original get ID function that I mentioned before, you write a very simple test function and the unit tester is, or, is, is able to pick that up and execute. We also integrate with uh, address sanitizer and undefined behavior sanitizer in the test framework. So we are able to catch bad behaviors in code like no pointer memory access or unfreed memory to ensure that any script user are writing are good. Integration test is a, you know, took a different approach. Uh, the integration test is trying to mimic the real production environment as much as possible. So we basically spin up the main binary and let it actually consume the real production scripts locally. In that way, we have a local environment that is very similar to production box, and we can actually send real HTTP test request, request against local host to uh, simulate the end-to-end -end workflow to actually test for uh, real client behavior. After testing is done, we can put code in production. Uh, what about debugging? Remember that was one pain point we had before. Well, GDB is quite a powerful tool for debugging, but GDB doesn't support jitted code out of box. The reason is that GDB is looking for uh, debugging information and symbols from object file. For dynamically generated code, the information simply isn't there. Um, luckily, GDB provides a way for debugging jitted code you simply need to register the in-memory symbol files with GDB. LLVM also provides APIs for you to do that. You create a GDB registration listener. What that does is every time you emit a new symbol in, uh, in the dynamic generated part, it also emits the symbol and debug information into an in-memory chunk. And the JIT engine ultimately is able to write all the data to a global variable. So when GDB actually attaches to the process, it knows where to look for all those dynamic symbols. With that in place, we're able to, uh, to debug the script code in production. On this topic, there are actually code samples on GitHub, uh, which was quite useful if you want to take a look or, or implement that on your own. After debugging is done, uh, profiling can follow a very similar pattern. For profiling to work, there are also a lot of great tools. For example, the perf tool in Unix. Um, again, the same problem, perf needs to understand all the symbols you generated dynamically. So we were waiting for LLVM to support uh, doing perf on jitted code. That actually happened last year uh, in the upstream. Uh, we were really excited, but we took a look it was based on a file format uh, JIT dump, which was relatively complex uh, and was relatively advanced. We were trying to integrate that with our system, um, but due to some Facebook specific issue, uh, it wasn't working for, for certain reasons. We have to uh, take a detour on this. We found that perf also supports a different way of reporting dynamic symbols, which is a different file uh, named after like slash tam slash perf pid map. It has a really straightforward file format. It's literally just a, a list of strings, which each line representing one symbol with a start location, a size, and a symbol name. So we basically closely followed what perf jit event listener was doing and wrote our own version of uh, perf map jit event listener. What that does is again, whenever we emit a new symbol, we simply report that in the different file, very similar to how LLVM tackles it, just like reporting a different format in a different file. So with that in place, we were able to do profiling on the, uh, on the production code in real time. And that actually gives us a lot of insights into which part of code is running slow, and we can do further optimization based on that. So with everything in place, we were actually able to convert all the previous scripting language to the new version in C++ by the end of the last year. Uh, we measured the performance and it was quite promising. This is a graph showing execution time of the same piece of business logic. 
where the, the blue line represents a previous scripting language and the red line represents a new C++ script. For the same piece of logic, uh, the new code simply runs three to four times faster than the previous generation. Not only that, we also measured the uh, distribution of execution time. So the graph here is mirroring, again, the same piece of business logic. Uh, the dark blue, I don't know if that shows up on the screen, the dark blue represents the previous um, scripting version and the light blue represents the C++ script. So in the old version, it definitely follows the normal distribution. Uh, for the, the inter more interesting is the light blue. It does not only run faster, but also has lower variation. So it's more stable uh, in execution time. All of these um, don't come free. There, yes, there is a certain cost associated with this approach. First of all, the binary size is larger than before, partially due to the statically linked uh, clan and LLVM libraries, partially due to the additional PCH file that we have to ship. But remember this cost, we only need to pay that once per you know, stable binary, where the script is still very lightweight. In addition, because we compile the C++ script at runtime or rather ahead of time, there's added two to three seconds on the startup uh, latency, which is you know, acceptable. But we have uh, like additional add cases and quirks to deal with. For example, thread local storage. So the ORCID doesn't support thread local storage uh, very well, uh, and we're using emulated DLS. So when dealing with some add cases, we actually need to have hacky workaround to tr you know, translate external linkage to internal linkage with proper definitions. Um, I mentioned that just to say, uh, if you want to take the same approach, there might be edge case you need to take care of. Uh, last but not the least, we have to adapt to ORCID upstream API change. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I actually really appreciate the continuous support from upstream, um, but keep that in mind because whenever upstream change, you have to monitor your build, and sometimes it can fail because of the upstream API change. You simply need to adapt to that and fix that. In terms of the next step, um, based on the perf measured with the instrumentation, we're able to identify some hotspot or identify um, code path that can be optimized further, mostly like regex parsing, parsing and uh, matching. So there are tons of opportunities for us to do profile-guided optimization with a new framework. We also want to implement smarter clan checker. So the existing pipeline makes sure the code can compile, can work, um, but we can, do, we can do more than that. We can probably add some instrumentation to enforce some like, good practice in coding or maybe add some enforcement of Facebook-specific logic uh, that can be made possible because now we control how we compile the, the, the script. We also want to embrace new C++ feature. Remember every dependency right now is managed by the pre-compiled header. Since C++ module is available, which provides a more restrictive set of interfaces, maybe we'll try that in the future to replace the pre-compiled headers. Also, uh, what about coroutines uh, TS? So we have very limited support for async execution as of today. Maybe um, using coroutine in the future will expand our spectrum. Last, I want to say thank you to the LLVM Society because um, all the great tooling and, and libraries you're, so you're providing, as well as the great tutorial. So a fun fact, when this project initially started, we were very closely following the building a JIT in LLVM tutorial, and that has been extremely helpful. Um, we also appreciate the continued support from the society. We were even trying to uh, give back to the community whenever we find a bug. We also report that. I think Facebook LLVM team actually um, reported bugs to upstream and tried to submit a fix. And hopefully that will you know, be accepted soon. Um, that's also why I'm here today to share the story of uh, how we built the JITED environment and um, share to share the fact that JITED code can be run in production at, at scale. Um, I'm also here to listen to you about any feedback or suggestions you have. So any question is welcome. Thank you.
So, any questions? <clears throat> you can have lots of questions because there is extra time. Hi, so thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is, did you consider just compiling the business logic C++ into a shared object instead and loading that at start time? Like, what's the big benefit of jitting it instead? Yeah, very good question. So because our binary is actually um, pushed less frequently, we, we considered using uh, DLL, but that will introduce inconsistency issue because by the time when you build the DLL, you want to make sure that actually it's compatible with the original binary that we shipped to every single server, and that's, that can be a problem. So rather than worrying about that, we think we can pay the trade-off to actually compile the code in real time to make sure it's always compatible with the original binary. Any other questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I might be missed that, but I'm curious, how do you deal with uh, basically shared global mutable state? So can you like rerun the script and if it changes the global state, then what, what happens and how you deal with that? I see, uh, I think that's a great question. So there are two parts of this. So first of all, the script typically defines a function that is lightweight that doesn't modify global states a lot, right? So things like uh, parsing the ID from a URL, that is a stateless function. So most likely, stateless function will go into scripts. Uh, maybe in the future, we want to support a script that modifies global states, but typically what we do today for that particular part is we would write that part of logic in the uh, main binary itself and only expose certain functionality to the script for it to modify global states. For example, for logging or maybe bumping, bumping counters, uh, that's how it's handled right now. But most likely, all those scripts are stateless. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I just wondered, did you, did you have any security concerns about putting Elevium and Clang into a, a load balancer on, on the internet? I realized that the scripts are coming from a trusted source inside Facebook, so you're okay, but you are running uh, the load balancer and sort of LLVM sort of un, unhardened code in the same process. And I was just wondering if there were any concerns about doing that or if, or if you had like a team review and said, you know, this is fine. Yeah, so uh, I think there are two aspects to the question. The first uh, is a security at a larger scale. Simply running anything on the balancer itself is a security problem. So there is a, a different set of solutions handling that, how to make sure everything we run on load balancer is secure, that is you know, kind of uh, orthogonal to, I guess, what part of the problem we're trying to solve with the script. Now to answer the script part, because a script is actually written by kind of the same, well, similar set of developers who actually develop the main binary. So we don't really have a security concern. The script doesn't come from um, like arbitrary developer or doesn't come from external source. So uh, our philosophy is like, because it's written by the same set of developers who can actually modify the main binary, uh, we don't worry about the scripting part that much. I don't know if that answers your question. Who's next? Um, if you could build it again, would you do it the same way? <laughs> <laughs> so I like the question. Um, if I answer no, I'm probably going to be fired. But uh, <laughs> so I think so. But I want to learn if you have any advice or you see any drawbacks of the current system. Uh, if I have to answer personally, I would build it from scratch like we did today. Um, Instead, like, so basically just bypassing all the scripting language we used before, I'd go directly to the C++ model. You mentioned that TLS uh, causes some headaches. Are there any um, other language constructs or features that you had to change or disallow because of this uh, setup? Yeah, good question. Um, the only thing I can remember is for resolving uh, some weak symbols that we don't really want. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, I think ORCJIT uh, doesn't like, um, I think ORCJIT doesn't like zero pointers. Uh, so I think we had to do some hacks around that, but that's the only other thing I can remember. So it, it works kind of fine-ish for pretty much everything else.
So I totally buy the performance uh, interest of using C++ as well as interfacing, but uh, debugging C++, optimized C++, jitted optimized C++ compared to debugging a scripting language. It doesn't seem easier. Um, so it sounds a bit biased. Uh, you, you get the performance and you strive to be debuggable, but it's not easier than the scripting language. I see. Yeah, that, that's fair. That's a, very, that's a fair question. So I guess it's easier uh, not in terms of implementation, but it, it's easier in terms of the ecosystem we have. So because we are running the main C++ binary already, we have a lot of tooling just to support doing perf, doing you know, like stack trace analysis. Uh, because of that, if we can make the debugging and profiling work for the script, we naturally have the entire ecosystem backing it up to support it. Great question. Any other question? I think there is time for this and the last one, or maybe a couple of questions. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, just a quick question. Do you think this kind of like scripting like for C++ helps the templates or any like meta programming primitives? Uh, you mean helping templates in, in what sense? Uh, like maybe helps it like for developers easy to write because uh, for example like currently in C++ when we write like template codes uh, and if you want to like split the implementation or like specialization into like different compilation unit it will be a kind of pain and so do you think this kind of can help this? Um, personally I don't think so because as I mentioned, uh, this actually comes with a cost, right? We are, we are okay to accept all the costs because of some trade-offs we have to make. Remember, in our scenario, we want the main binary to be stable, so we don't want to, opt, uh, to update that often. Remember, whenever we want to update that, it's a matter of like pushing a large binary to the entire fleet of all the load balancers. Uh, so there are, I guess there are some certain rules that we're following so that to us, this is a perfect solution. I don't think that replaces the template or, or other you know, C++ semantics that we have today. Okay. That's, that's my personal take, yeah. Um, why is it so much easier to push a script file to your whole fleet of load balancers than a new binary? Because a script file can be like one kilobytes or maybe less than that, or the binary is quite large. But what kind of quite large are we talking about? Uh, I don't know if I, I can disclose Like 100 that. megabytes or? Uh, definitely more than that. Because remember, so the thing I disclose is like the overhead itself is, is more about 100 megabytes. Right, so more oh. than 100. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, just the, and just the inconvenience of sending that over the internet to your machines is? Also, also saving network bandwidth, right? So if a script is, I don't know, the small script can be a couple of lines and it's just a couple of uh, bytes, maybe less than one kilobytes, sending that comparing to over 100 megabytes is five magnitudes off. So that's, that, that but, makes a difference. Like that's so much more convenient that it justifies this, the, this whole talk. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, all the work behind the dot, Lila, you know, like doing separating out part in the main binary and part in a scripting binary and, yep. and all. Uh, remember also, because of this, we also have the ability to hot reload, uh, you know, a piece of code without restarting the binary. So for a load balancer, restarting is a big deal. Yes, we have some mechanism to kind of make the transition smoother, but again, restarting a load balancer is, is, a, is a big deal for us. It's not a stateless server. Right, yeah. uh, well, it, it's stateless, stateless in a sense. So we want to minimize the interruption as much as possible. So it's, I guess, one additional benefit we get. Thanks. And that one over here, well, there's a couple of questions. These two are going to be the last, I think. Hello, I'm just thinking about uh, when you have loaded, uh, let's say, 20, 30, 100 scripts, uh, is the LLVM or JIT API removing the old JIT code or keeping it in memory? Is there some garbage collection at some point? Or do you end up with, with dead code in your process memory, never deleted, or things like that? Uh, so actually, we can have multiple scripts. 
But the current implementation is they're putting one uh, translation unit when we compile it. Uh, that answers the first part of the question. In terms of dead code, that's a great question. Um, that can happen, I think. So yes, that's something we can work on. But no, we haven't considered you know, dealing with dead code. Okay. And you never had to reboot because it took too, many, too much memories in the end because you had too many dead code in your memory? Or uh, not really if you compare the script part versus yeah. the main uh, HTTP stack in the main binary. It's okay. not comparable. OK, thanks. Just an open question about, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, reloading scripts. Or can you just tell us about the limitation and the challenge of updating a script at runtime? Oh, OK. Time? So it actually doesn't add a lot of overhead. Once you have the, the JIT engine inside, uh, if you can compile like a script and extract symbols and the implementation that run, you know, at ahead of a time, you can also do that like kind of dynamically at runtime. So uh, for that part, you need to modify the code a little bit, but not a lot. Assuming you're stateless. Correct. Assuming that function itself is also stateless. Yes. So thanks. Thank one, once again, the, the speaker. Oh, thank you.